Writing a ray tracer is not that hard. I mean, here's one written in C in under a hundred lines. The thing is, these simple ray tracers usually only support spheres and basic materials. What if you wanted to render something more complicated, like a phone or a car? Yeah, how about a car? See, that's definitely not a sphere. Today, we're not writing a ray tracer, okay? That's easy. We're creating art. All right, we need a car. Hold on, hold on. See, we, we, don't, we don't do things the intelligent way around here. I, I, I should have specified that, my apologies. See, everyone knows you can't flex by using other people's work. Disgusting. Obviously, I'm gonna make my own. See, this is this is very personal for me. Um, I was I was hurt before when I was when I was just a young bro in my early teens. I downloaded Blender and the first thing the first thing I tried to do was model a car. I was a little bit ambitious apparently. I was stupid. I thought it would be easy, and I failed. But then I grew up. I got knowledge. And here we are, doing it again. <sighs> but, in the end, I... I failed again. I don't... I don't know what to say. I mean, I... I think I'm... I think I'm just gonna give up. Wrong! We don't give up around here, okay? I forced myself to do it again. I threw out my old model because it was garbage. Like, it took, I just wanna make it clear, it took a long time. It took a long time to make this, but it's just, it's bad. It looks like a deflated fish. I was like, no, I am not releasing this. We're, we're gonna do this all over again. I learned from my mistakes, and I came up with this foolproof method of modeling cars. All right, so the, the first step, you block out the basic shape. It's sort of like sketching, but in 3D. Don't overthink it, just do it. Slowly refine this shape by adding more geometry, and as you add geometry, make sure to keep the topology nice and clean, not like this. Once you have a pretty decent shape, apply a subdivision surface modifier. Now we have a bunch of separate parts that need to be merged. Use these parts as guides and then draw a better mesh on top. This is called retopologizing. It's pretty common in character design and kind of just 3D modeling in general. Throughout this process, also make sure to mark the lines of the car's body panels. This helps both with lining things up with the reference, but now we can use them to actually draw the body panels. Fill in this geometry, adding smaller details, and remember that all of this new geometry sticks to this base mesh that we designed earlier, so everything stays perfectly smooth even as we add more complex geometry. Once all the body panels are done, fill in the smaller components of the car, which is basically just a bunch of modeling, None of the parts on their own are particularly difficult, and about five and a half years later, something like that, you will have this car model. For those that are wondering, this is a 1962 Maserati Tipo 151. I chose it because it looks unusual, and I like unusual things. It has character to it. Only a few were made for racing back in the day, and I, I thought it would be cool to modify this design slightly to make it into a road car. I also couldn't find any models of this car online, and that means that this is the best model of this car ever made, so obviously, congratulations to me. You know, you know how it is. All right, so we have a car model. Now, that's, that's cute and everything, but we need to render it. I did write a new beret tracer back in 2019, and I, I did get some good results from it, but it's missing some parts. We have no UI, so how am I going to flex my insane programming skills with a command line program? Everyone knows this is not possible. And also from a technical perspective, we're missing important things like direct light sampling, bump mapping, and procedurally generated noise. I pretty much need all of these things for this particular scene. We do need to have priorities though. 
flexing always comes first, so we do need a UI. <laughs> In all seriousness though, a UI is pretty useful, because otherwise I can't see the progress of a render, and I can only see it when it's done, which is pretty annoying. There are some pretty good C++ UI libraries on GitHub though, and this time I was gonna do things the intelligent way. I was, I was there, I went to GitHub, I was just about to clone the repository, and then I don't know what happened. Like my internet just stopped working, my router was reduced to atoms in front of my eyes. It was really, it was quite something. And clearly the only thing that can be done in this case is I, I just had to make one from scratch. So that's, that's what I ended up doing. Luckily, anyone who isn't new to my channel knows that I am working on reinventing a different wheel, the game engine. I have my own game engine, and I thought this would be a good time to test it out. So I use it to make a simple UI. First, I cloned the template project I made, then I did some coding off camera, and I made this programming language. It's, it's really not that important. Oh, oh, I, I didn't mention that. Okay, um, so basically, I wrote this programming language slash specification language thing, and I call it Piranha. It actually works okay, to be fair. It's it's basically, it's a node-based programming language. And it's very confusing, but it makes sense to me. And, and, it has syntax highlighting, so, you know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. The purpose of it is to specify node-based materials and systems, similar to a compositor, but in text form. In many ways, I find this easier than dragging and dropping nodes in Blender. Anyway, I set this up to recompile automatically when it finds that my source file has been changed. As you can see, here's a simple hello world program. This is not a sequential programming language though. You can do some really cursed stuff like this where the variable comes after its usage. It's not really a variable, but anyway, I'll spare you the details. It's a weird programming language. I integrated all this with my path tracer and got it to display the output of the path tracer in real time. Now, as you can see, it looks pretty ugly, but I spent some time and I made it look good, you know, for flexing purposes. Now, this preview window is totally generic. You can set it up to display anything. You can preview colors, images, path tracer outputs, the results of image transformations, etc. These also all update in real time. And just as an example, I set up this basic Piranha program to process an image. Basically, it removes the blue background behind this frozen dairy product and displays the result. It's groundbreaking, I know. I actually find this more intuitive than working with other visual image editing tools. So Adobe, please DM me on LinkedIn or something. And we can talk about licensing after this video, of course. All right, we need a few more things. We need procedural noise, which is useful because you can apply a texture to an object without going to the effort of generating texture coordinates. So the value of the noise map is entirely determined by position. Another very important thing that we need is direct light sampling. Now, I won't talk too much about this, but basically it just makes things fast. The general idea is as your path tracer is generating a path through your scene, at each vertex, you can directly sample every light source instead of relying only on the end of your path. This dramatically improves performance by essentially reducing noise. As you can see, without direct light sampling, it would take a few minutes just to see if your materials look decent, which is pretty pathetic. The final thing that we need in order to get that blender look is something called tone mapping. If you were to directly map the output of a path tracer to RGB, so for example, let's say your path tracer outputs a light intensity values between zero and infinity technically, and you clip that range between zero and one, and then map that to between zero and 255, like you would find in a 24-bit image, it's gonna look pretty bad, trust me, okay? It looks very 2005, and we've come a long way since then. The trick here is that most cameras and your eye can cram a lot more dynamic range without clipping, and they can do that because their response is not perfectly linear. So this has the effect of compressing a much wider array of intensities into a smaller range. 
I implemented two tone mapping functions. One is ACES, which is commonly used in cinema, and the other is Hable tone mapping, which is commonly used in video games. Anyway, all right, we're done. Now, all we have to do is translate these Blender materials into Piranha nodes. For the most part, this is a fairly straightforward process. I made sure to implement all the nodes that I needed in Piranha, so I don't have to take any shortcuts, just copy them right over from Blender. The first render was... it was okay, but I didn't really like the glass because it looked a little bit too perfect. This was because the entire scene was kind of unrealistic in the sense that the studio was basically floating in the vacuum of space. Any real studio would have some light leaks or background reflections, and this background light would reflect off of the glass, giving our eye a clue that something is actually there. So I hacked a basic environment map in to deal with that, and here you go, here's the final image. It's basically the same one that was in my thumbnail. I did about 16,000 samples per pixel, and the reason why it had to be so high is mainly because of the interior. Rendering anything behind glass complicates things a little bit, and there's still some noise on the inside, but for a unidirectional path tracer, it's actually not that bad. Just as a comparison, here is the output from Blender. Now, they're not exactly the same because the geometry is a bit different, but the quality is comparable. I prefer the tone mapping in my ray tracing over the one in Blender because it doesn't oversaturate bright areas, and that was one thing that I actually didn't like very much in the initial Blender render that I did. Maybe I was doing something wrong, I don't know. Blender's Path Tracer, which is called Cycles by the way, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, is also quite a bit more efficient. It's about 30 to 40% faster depending on the scene. And based on some profiling that I did and digging around in Blender's code, it's probably because it uses Intel's Embry library for spatial partitioning. I might look into using this in the future, but I didn't really need it for this project, so I didn't bother. Just as a final flex, I wanted to show what can be done with these procedural materials. I rendered an alternate version with racing stripes, and these racing stripes were actually generated totally procedurally, so they're not textures. The code to generate them is pretty simple, it's basically just two rectangle functions, and the input parameter is the z-axis. And that's basically what mixed the red and white colors. Now, I know that some people out there don't really get the point of this. You may be thinking, it's cool and all, but aren't there more efficient ways of rendering an image? Well, yes, obviously there are. But I don't do this to be efficient. I do it because I enjoy it, and it really is that simple. I also learned a lot from this project, and I'm definitely not an expert, in case that wasn't obvious. A developer who specializes in graphics might watch this and think I'm a total noob, but that's fine, everyone starts somewhere, and for me, the easy way to learn something is to just do it the hard way. Alright, that's pretty much all I have for today. Thanks for watching everyone. All of the code for this project is open source, obviously, and it's on my GitHub. The link is in the description. I should note that it isn't really ready for public release, but after this video is released, I'll focus on polishing the code and getting a version out that you guys can try. Alright, bye for now, and have a great day.